Welcome to Inside the History. And we're here live on the road on the USS Salem in Quincy, Massachusetts at the former Fall River Shipyard where both Battleship Massachusetts and Destroyer Kennedy was built. I'm Tom, Thomas James Lowney, Gunner's Mate First Class, retired with Dr. John Scholes. And we're here to give you an inside history in both the USS Salem, Naval History, and the Fall River Shipyard as well. So we can take you for a walking tour of inside the gun turrets, through the magazines, through some of the control spaces, and give you an insight into the history of here at the Fall River Shipyard, where history has been made in Massachusetts and building some of the best ships in the world. And Salem being the last all-gun heavy cruiser built by the United States and still the last all-gun heavy cruiser still in existence in the world. So thank you for joining us. We're about to go on board. We'll see you there. We'll give you inside of the history. Thank you. Welcome back to Inside the History on board USS Salem here in Quincy, Massachusetts. And again, Tom Lowney, Gunner's Mate First Class with Dr. John Scholes, our fire control and gunnery expert, and Battleship Cruiser Geek, as he calls himself, the man with the information, my knowledge base. You'd be surprised how many people know stuff from where and how. Dr. Skoll is quite the uh, uh, subject expert who is uh, self-educated as well, and uh, we thank him for being here. Right now we're inside the magazine, the powder magazine, and it's set up, and we're going to go through some things to show you. Dr. Skoll is going to walk you through, and I uh, and a few others here will assist in demonstrating some of the operations here. Dr. Scholes, thank you for coming back again. And we're here and listening. Please let us in. Very good. Well, we're in one of the four powder case magazines for the 8 inch 55 rapid fire turret. This particular powder case magazine, as you can see here, based on the stenciling on the wall, contains 176 powder cases for the 8 inch 55 gun. There are other magazines and adding them all together, there's a total of 450 powder cases or 150 powder cases for each of the three 8 inch 55 caliber guns. This is the space where they're stored and we're going to illustrate for you with a drill powder case how the powder cases are moved from this magazine through a flame type tight scuttle into the powder handling spaces and then we'll show you how they're loaded into the powder hoist to go up to the guns. You'll notice here, this this is chilled water, yeah. cooling. These are kept at a very constant temperature. And Tom can tell you why. <laughs> yeah, these, the magazines are similar throughout the fleet. Well, five inch, six inch, sixteen inch. The basic chill water system that keeps the temperature below seventy degrees keep the ammunition in a stable, good healthy condition so that way it uh, does not overheat. What's nice with this magazines here on this part of the ship they're away from the engineering plants so the temperature is readily easily controlled. You also have when condensate and chilled water you have all these drain lines and they go over to a bucket and it's again part of your same thing as in Massachusetts when you come in here do your magazine temps on a daily basis you gotta empty the water bucket because condensate it's just like your air conditioner at home. You got that drain going on the outside, got to get rid of the water. Same thing here. Mother Nature does not change on a warship, so we have to adapt for it. As well as the temperature bracket up there for the thermometer, which is not here because it used to be mercury. And the sample containers on the side, that would be for sampling and testing your powder to make sure it was still good as well. So there's numerous little things in here that uh, being a former mag rat myself, and taking care of them on the Wisconsin. Everything is pretty much the same. You have your uh, bellows and your thermostats for the uh, magazine sprinkler system as well. And as you can see, your fire main comes through. You can remotely operate to flood the magazines as well. As you can see, it's marked out for fire main. And these cables you see here are for remote operation of a manual valve. So there's a lot in here that happens. You also have ventilation that's brought in here as well because it's a enclosed space and you want to have people breathing, handling ammunition. 
covered the small stuff, John. Very good. And, and as is usual, whew, consistency and accuracy is absolutely necessary both for safety and for the precision accuracy of these guns. Exactly. All right, inside the end of the magazine, we're going to show you how these ammunition for this Mark 16 gun is sent from here into the turret. Uh, these powders are set up and stowed in an upright position to make it easier access. And because they're a rapid fire gun, you don't have the luxury you'd like to to have a separate canister you want to get these in as fast as possible so they go from the upright position as you can see as you go through each rack the bars are taken out so that way you can access into it as quickly as possible so you'd have a crew in here working very fervently because rapid fire gun you have to keep these moving so as you take them out and clear it there'll be another person coming in he'll be taking the racks putting them aside so that way you could have a continuous flow of ammunition. So we're going to go through that motion. John, if you want to explain, Ben, can you give me a hand here? All right. We are now going to simulate with a drill project, uh, powder case uh, loading through the powder scuttle into the powder passing space. This 140 pound drill powder case is going to be unlatched from the racks. It's then going to be picked up with a little hand dolly. We're going to move it into the scuttle. There's actually a latch in there, which will be compressed when it's fully loaded in there. It will then be rotated by somebody on the other side of the bulkhead and will emerge on the other side and we'll be showing you that as well. Okay, and I'm gonna get out of the way and let the gunner's mates move the drill case into the powder passing scuttle. That one works. So we'd come up here, come up on the powder can, unlatch it. You'd always have someone stabilizing it. You gotta remember we're moving shift. So what you would have to do is two men, rotate it out, one person guides, go ahead, hold it man. Tilt it back a little bit, shove it in. And you hold the base, bring it in, pick her up. Oh, she wants a stick. Hands clear. Rotate it. And it's two sided so that way you can continuously cycle and load at the same time. Once in, takes out the other side. Now that a powder case has been loaded into the scuttle in the magazine, indeed this needs to be rotated so that it can emerge here so we can then take it and put it in to the hoist. This structure is rotating so that it is flame tight. No flames can come from here into the magazine or from the magazine obviously out here. Uh, this was actually important when the USS Newport News had her turret 2 explosion in Vietnam because some of the gases and flames from that explosion vented all the way down the powder hoist into this space. But this space, first of all, gives a lot of space for expansion. So the pressure dropped and these scuttles are completely flame and gas tight, so it could not pass into the magazine. This bulkhead is solid and about an inch thick, so it's not going to rupture that bulkhead. So that explosion never endangered the magazines of the USS Newport News. Unfortunately, a lot of the men in the turret died, 
but the magazines were safe because of the ammunition handling precautions that are built into U.S. Navy warships. All right, right. now we're going to demonstrate how we get that powder case from the magazine out, and then we'll put it in to the powder hoist so it can go up to the gun. All righty. Standing by. And in operation, there would be a sailor here to operate this hoist, or it could also be programmed to be completely automatic, and there's a trigger in the back for when it's filled, it'll start going up. As you can see, the shuttered doors have been wired back to keep it open so it doesn't clip anybody's hands, but there'd be a person here operating this as well. That way, when you get the projectile and force it in, uh, the powder can in, it stays in. The spring loaded and it has to be manually overrided to put it in and out. So that now, way it's locked in place. To load ammunition into the magazines, all of this process is run in reverse. The powder cases come down, the powder hoist, these shutters are locked open. The powder case is picked up again on the cart. Moved over to the flame tight rotating scuttle. And then rotate it back into the magazine. And the process you saw before is reversed as well. It's picked up out of the scuttle, moved back to the rack, and locked into the racks. This process seems like a lot of work, but was actually much easier and much faster than the more conventional method by which the older turrets and the battleship turrets were loaded. It took about also one quarter the amount of time to fully load the magazines as you would have in an older bag gun, 8-inch turret, or in a 16-inch battleship turret. You may have noticed that the ammunition was somewhat roughly handled to get it into the case and compress the locking triggers. We will see that the powder case gets moved around with considerable speed and force in the loading process, which is why all the live powder cases only had electric primers, no percussion primers. So no hitting it with a hammer, the primer will not go off. In fact, it's recessed into the base of the case, so only the electric ignition mechanism can fire it. Because you always have to worry about, since the can rests on the deck, the primer, if it was percussion activated, anything on the deck could accidentally trigger it. So, yeah, electric would be a wiser choice on that one. Yeah, these were electric only. You'll notice that there are three powder hoists, one for each gun. And you'll also notice this gap here. The deck that Tom Lani is standing on is fixed, as are the magazines and the scuttles to pass from them. The deck I'm standing on is rotating with the turret. When these guns would be in operation, in real action, this is in continuous motion because the guns are being continually moved to aim at the target. So this is continually rotating. Powder case, having been moved into the hoist, these shutters are latched behind it so it can't fall out, and either manually with this lever, the hoist is raised, or if it's set in an automatic position, as soon as this case is fully in, it compresses a trigger in the back of the hoist, and it goes up 
automatically. Now all three of these are being continuously loaded and a case has to go into them once every six seconds because that's the rate of fire of the gun, one round every six seconds. So you can imagine how busy a process this is. And there normally would be three men bringing the powder cases and getting them in the hoist. One guy here operating the hoist. There'd also be a petty officer or a gunner's mate in charge supervising the entire process. On this board, you can see the last crew that actually operated this particular powder handling flat in the 8H55 rapid fire gun. And Honeycutt is here, but Pierce is not. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in again and watching the inner works of the 8 inch 55 Mach 16 gun turret and its operations here on the magazines, bringing up the ammunition through the system. Thank you, John, very much for the all the information. You're always a wealth of information. Great to have you here with us. I appreciate your time and efforts. And we look forward to seeing you in other parts of the ship and other segments. Very good. We'll be following those powder cases up to the guns, show how they're loaded, and we'll also be seeing the other part of the uh, ammunition, the projectile, and how that gets into the hoist and up to the guns. And from there, we'll uh, end this segment. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in again. I'd like you to like, share, and subscribe, and to get involved if you can. Contact with us through the site, and uh, we'll see if we can get you involved in helping out here at the ships. And we survive on your help, donations, and your visitation because these ships are yours. We're just providing you the history so that you can see how we ran the Navy through our times. Thanks again. I'm Tom Lowney, Inside the History. Take care. See you next time.